Well, good morning and welcome to Antioch Online. My name's Ian and I'm the associate pastor here at Antioch. I just want to say I am so glad that you have decided to tune in with us. And wherever you are watching this from today, we would love to hear from you. So if you would like to get in touch with one of our pastors, then the best way that you can do that is to head to our website, antiochsheffield.org.uk. There's also a link in the description of the video. And right there on our homepage, you'll see a button that says Contact Us. Just click that button and you'll be able to get in touch with one of our pastors. Today we're going to begin our service with a time of worship. And I'm aware that for some of you who are watching today, worship may be an entirely new experience. But worship is just our response to God for who He is and what He has done in our lives. And these songs that our worship team are about to lead us in are just prayers and passages of Scripture that have been set to music. And our heart's desire today is that these songs will help you express your own heart to God in some way. And so I want to encourage you to set aside your devices, to remove all distractions as best as you can, to turn up the volume, and let's worship Jesus together. Thank 
conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy.
last week, I shared about where we're at as a church and how we're navigating this season when we're not able to gather together publicly. And one of the things that I highlighted is that in, in one sense, nothing has really changed. We're still called to live out the same values that we always do, you know? I talked about what it means to, you know, as a member of this church, we're trying to instill four essential values in you, and that it are these, devotion to Jesus, commitment to community, living missionally, and gift-oriented serving. And the beauty of those values is that you can live them out whatever situation you find yourself in, whether it's in the middle of a pandemic or when life is, is just normal. So today, though, I want to drill into one of these values a little bit. I want to take a closer look at what it means to live missionally, to live missionally. Because as I said last week, the mission of this church ultimately is to fulfill the, what we call the Great Commission, which Jesus, were Jesus' final words to his original disciples, but are still just as applicable to us today, and that is to go into all nations, uh, making disciples of Jesus, teaching them to obey him and to follow him. That's what we're all about as a church, and just because we're in the midst of a pandemic, that hasn't changed any of that. In fact, it's made it even more important. But the other reason I think it's important for us to talk about living missionally is if you remember back in January, I mean, doesn't that seem like a lifetime ago? <laughs> we talked about what we felt like God was speaking to our church for 2020, and we felt like 2020 was to be a year of mission for us. And I don't think that's changed. I think 2020 is still a, a year of mission for our church. Now, Obviously, it's looking different than we expected, but it is still very much a year of mission for our church. But the question that, you know, that I think is obvious here that we have to ask is, how do we live missionally in this season? How do we live missionally in this season where, you know, thank, thank the Lord that we have had a restri uh, some of the restrictions of lockdown eased over the last few weeks but we still have lots of restrictions in place. We're a long way from life as normal. So how do we live on mission in this season? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Now, first, let me explain what I mean by this whole idea of living missionally. I define it this way. Living missionally is a mindset of leveraging your daily routines because Going on mission isn't just something we go and do, it's a lifestyle that we live. So it's a mindset of leveraging your daily routines to tell others about Jesus, both through your words and actions. Living missionally is, is about just something we incorporate. It's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a mindset that, that, that explains who Jesus is, that, that looks for those opportunities to tell other people about Jesus, to display the love of Jesus through our words and through our actions. Now, one of the best examples we have of this in the whole Bible is the Apostle Paul. And he described his mindset of living missionally this way in 1 Corinthians 9. He says this, even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And when he's saying I'm a slave there, he's not saying he's, a, he's an actual slave. What he's saying is I'm going to leverage my freedom. I'm going to use my life in order that I might bring many people to Christ. And then he elaborates on that. And, and he says in verse 22 and 23, he says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. That's an example of living missionally. That's the mindset of living missionally. You see, Paul wanted to do everything he could in order to, uh, to, to share the good news with people. He was looking for every opportunity to win people to Jesus, and, and he leveraged his life. He, did, he used all of his influence, all of his, all of his life was sacrificed towards this goal of winning people to God, of sh uh, spreading the good news throughout the earth, and as we know, he was immensely successful in doing that. We can do the same thing. Now, it might not look like the Apostle Paul, 
But we can all embrace this mindset of living missionally, of, of seeing yourself as a missionary. You know, I, I use that word missionary, and we, also, we, we think about the, the, uh, the definition of it as somebody that moves to a different country to tell people about Jesus. And that is one way, that is true, that is a definition of the word missionary, but I think it's a narrow definition. I think actually all followers of Jesus are to see themselves as missionaries, that we all live missionally in order to uh, leverage our lives, use our lives to win people to Christ wherever we at, wherever we're at. We don't have to move overseas in order to do that. We can do that right in the midst of our daily life and our daily routines. It's a lifestyle that we can embrace, whether we're at work or we're at uni or we're with our neighbors, or with our friends, or at the pub, or in one of our clubs. I mean, we can leverage every one of those opportunities as, as, as a chance to tell people about Jesus. Notice there also that Paul describes this as good news. I just, <laughs> I love that, because that's what the gospel is. It's good news. I mean, I realize the world doesn't really see it that way right now. I, I realize having a religious conversation is about as comfortable as having a conversation about politics right now. We just don't want to go there. But you got to think about it this way. I mean, what do you do whenever you see a great film or go out to a restaurant that you really enjoy? Or uh, maybe you go on a holiday that was really refreshing and enjoyable. What, what do you do when you have a really good experience like that? You tell other people about it, right? You tell them, hey, listen, I saw this film last weekend that you would love. you got to go check it out. Or, or, hey, I had dinner at this restaurant. Uh, I realize it's been a while since we've been out to a restaurant, but just remember those days. I went to this restaurant. It was so good. You would love it. Let's go there together this week. Or, hey, I went on holiday, and it was fantastic. I just floated on a cloud of sunshine for two weeks. I mean, you got to go to this place. You would love it. Whenever we discover something good, it's just natural for us to tell other people about it, and it's no different with our faith. See, we have the best news possible, that God loves us, that he cares about us, that he hasn't abandoned us, but that he's made a way through the death of Jesus for, our, uh, for us to be forgiven and reconciled to God, that we can be saved, that we can have a hope and a future, that, we, that heaven is our home, that we don't have to, to, to do life on our own, but that he is going to be with us no matter what we encounter. We have good news that this world desperately needs to hear. You see, we're living in a gospel moment. I loved how John Eldridge said that a few weeks ago when, when we had that interview with him. This is a gospel moment. The world is being shaken right now, and they're looking for some hope, some form of uh, something to put their hope in and their faith in, and they're more open than I can remember in my lifetime to looking at Jesus, to, to asking, is Jesus really who he claims to be? And we, this is, this is a, a season of harvest for us that we've got to take advantage of. And that's why it's so important for all of us on an individual level to embrace this and live missionally. But back to my original question, how do we live missionally in this season? <laughs> you know, when, when we've got all these restrictions going on, we, we can't, can't do life the way we normally would, as, uh, certainly not as much as we would like. So how do we live missionally in this season? Well, I think that our best opportunity is with our neighbors in this season. Now, of course, there'll be other opportunities. Maybe it's your colleagues at work or maybe it's your family. I, I don't know. But I think one of the best opportunities we have is with our neighbors in this season. I'm sure many of you have experienced what I've experienced over the last three or four months, and I've had more conversations with my neighbors than I can ever remember doing before, especially, you know, with our Thursday night clap for the NHS moments, you know. I, I love those because it was like a, 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 an unofficial, socially distanced neighborhood party every Thursday night when we came out, we clapped for the NHS, and then we'd just hang out and talk and catch up, and, and, and I enjoyed it. I met neighbors that I'd never, I've met, lived alongside for a couple of years now, not even met, not even seen. 
And we had the opportunity to get to know each other, to learn each other's names, and all of us enjoyed it. And we said, hey, we gotta, get, we gotta keep this going when life gets back to normal a little bit. I'm sure many of you have had the same experience. So I wanted to share with you today a couple of examples from people that I've heard of in recent days that, that are just doing a great job of, of reaching out to their neighbors, of loving their neighbors in this season. And earlier this week, I had a couple of conversations that, I'm gonna, that I want you to hear uh, the, of examples of people who are loving their neighbors well. And this first one that we're going to listen to is uh, with Mark Mayhew. And Mark and his family live in London. And uh, last year, he and his wife, Jen, uh, stepped onto our board of advisors here as a church. And uh, Mark is a strategist. He's super strategic. And that's one of the reasons I wanted him on our board. But when COVID-19 hit, Mark just thought, well, how can, how can we leverage this situation uh, for, 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 uh, to, to tell people about Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to my neighborhood. And he has such a great idea, and, and I wanted you to hear his story. Let's listen. Well, hey, Mark. Hey, Todd. How's it going? Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, I've had the, the privilege to get to know you over the past couple of years, um, but for those who ha haven't had the chance to meet you before, uh, give us a little bit about your background and your family and what you're up to today. Yeah, well, uh, it's great to be with you. Great to be with the Sheffield Church. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Yes, yeah, so my name is Mark Mayhew, and I'm originally from Southeast London. I grew up there um, as part of a network of churches called Exus. Um, I'm married to Jen. We live in London. Uh, we have this uh, uh, wonderful two-year-old called Emily. Uh, we live in Southwest London, so um, around the sort of Clapham, Wimbledon area. And um, my sort of work background is I'm in strategy. So I have a small uh, strategy and ventures firm that uh, we run in Southeast, Southwest London. Um, and then I've also been involved um, at other stages in my work. Um, really in the area of um, faith and the marketplace. So um, I spent about five years working at a Bible college, uh, helping to equip the church and Christians to think integratively about their faith um, and what they do Monday uh, to Saturday. So that's a little bit about my background. Wow. Well, you've been putting some of that strategic, uh, strategic gifting that you have to, to good use with an initiative during lockdown that you've started. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, one of the uh, things uh, about Jen and I is that we, when we dated, we were actually part of the Engage the Crisis um, in Lesbos. Um, so actually we did most of our time when we were dating was out there. And so that was an experience for us of um, being in an overwhelming situation of a humanitarian crisis. Um, right. and could, you, so, could you explain Engage the Crisis a little bit for those who aren't familiar with it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Engage the Crisis was a project that um, Antioch as a movement uh, took on around the world in response to the Syrian crisis where refugees were coming through Turkey across the water to Greece in these little rubber ducks, uh, not rubber ducks, rubber boats. <laughs> uh, rubber ducks is with Emily. This You've is got a two-year-old daughter. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like most of my life this day, these days is with rubber ducks, but these were on <laughs> rubber, rubber boats and they were coming across. Um, and many people would have been very disturbed to see that the, the picture of a boy that died on the beach um, in, in Greece, um, about four years ago and so there are about 10,000 people sometimes coming across a day on these boats and so Antioch mobilized volunteers to go and help work with people coming off the beaches um, and then also the refugees working their way through um, Europe and so that year we set up a number of bases across Europe and about 2,000 people from the Antioch movement volunteered across the summer and we called that project Engage the Crisis. And so Jen and I were privileged enough uh, to go. Um, it was a privilege for us to go and be working there and volunteering for three months on Lesbos. And one of the things we found in this sort of overwhelming crisis where you've got politics going on, you've got structural issues, um, and the needs are so great, is that 
we realized that in the middle of all of that, actually really what you need is you need one person loving and caring for another person. And that, that kind of marked our time in Lesbos um, because obviously you need people helping with this situation with the Syrian crisis up at like a, you know, governmental level and an international level. And then you need your big A groups to work, but also you need people to show up and love another person. And so while the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 was unfolding, um, I think Jen and I and a number of us who live in our community, our, uh, our sort of our community is about 15,000 in London, um, our neighborhood. Um, you know, what you started to realize is that people were asking this question, well, how do we respond to this enormous crisis that's, that's headed, heading in? And I think many of us felt quite overwhelmed. You know, it's not just a, a UK issue, it's a global issue. I think also if we think back then, no one really understood what was going on. How does this, how does this work? Um, and so we were asking the question, okay, well, what are we going to do? You know, and what are we going to do in the face of, you know, we might be locked down. So we went back to that idea of, okay, you know, in the end it comes down to, you know, people loving each other. And obviously, you know, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, you know, is, is the second commandment and uh it's funny how you know jesus sort of it's like sunday school he's always got the answer um and so we started to think about okay what could we do in earlsfield and we were struck particularly by a statistic that said i think about four or five million people over 70 live alone in the uk and so we started to think about okay as this unfolds in the area of london that we're in how are people who are vulnerable isolated in need um, whether it's economic or it's to do with their health, how are they going to get helped? What is our area of London? Uh, how is that going to work? And is this something we could do? So we started doing some research and um, we started seeing that people had these ideas of forming uh, street communities. And so what we did is we um, put together a bit of a vision where we put it out to the community and we said, hey, what if there's about 110 streets in our community which you know all of a sudden doesn't sound that many i mean it's a lot of streets but it's not that many and that covers right. like i said about fifteen thousand people and so we said well what if we formed a street community on every single street in the neighborhood and what if those communities committed to just getting to know their neighbors working out who needed what and started to support each other and so you know we came up with the phrase um everyone cared for and no one alone so we were saying, well, you know, what if we did this also as a community? So there are so many people that we know um, of different faith backgrounds or no faith, and everyone was concerned and wanting to do something. So we got in touch with a few people that we know in this area, and we said, hey, this is an idea. You know, we could sort of come together and give this vision of street communities across our neighborhood. And um, so... What we, the way we were going to do that is to recruit what we called street coordinators. So a couple of people on each street who would then go out and reach out to their street and form these communities. And um, we were on a Zoom call. We were hoping to get about 10 to 15 people initially. Uh, we got on the Zoom call and there were 55 people. Most of the people, wow. like we, we didn't know who they were. Just word of mouth went out. And everyone got hold of this vision. And within 70 odd hours, we had street coordinators for every single street in Oxford. Oh, wow. So the wow. thing just like, just enlarged so much. And so now we've been going, you know, since, since the beginning of this crisis, and each street has been working to shop for neighbors, you know, check in on people who are on their own, people that are in need. Um, Lender, you know, people have been uh, one street uh, lady lives on her own to 94 and they uh, gave her a cake and everyone came out and stood in there uh, at the end of the, the, the drive, uh, you know, the end of their um, yeah. uh, driveway, I'm thinking Texas, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> outside their front door yeah. and they sang her happy birthday. And so there've been all these different things of communities, streets taking responsibility for themselves um looking after each other and then what we've done is we connected all the streets together so that then they could share resources that they could also troubleshoot issues 
Um, our food bank here was running out of food. And so we put out the word to 100 streets and we collected over 60 cars worth of food and filled up the food bank. So we've been able to mobilize as 100 odd streets to then meet frontline issues, whether that was PPE issues at our local hospital, um, food issues, other supply issues. So it's been incredible. It's been amazing. Um, and, and, you know, and it's funny, people are saying, like, we never want to go back. Now that we've experienced this kind of community on our street, um, we, you know, we don't want to go back. So on our, our street, for example, most streets are connected by a WhatsApp group. So they have their own sort of WhatsApp group. And then what they'll do is they'll have ways of connecting with people that maybe aren't on um, WhatsApp. And so we have, I think, over 140 people, adults, on our WhatsApp group for our street, uh, which pretty much covers it all. And, yeah, people are getting to know each other. Um, and they're saying it is the kind of community I've never experienced in my life, in, you know, and then particularly in a, you know, a, a densely urban environment. Yeah, what I love about that is, is I found since I've lived here for almost 13 years now, um, and what I found is that a lot of people are really isolated and, uh, and there's only certain avenues that our culture gives us to connect with other people and, and neighborhoods and neighbors isn't really one of them until this pandemic hit. And, and I think that this is so brilliant because it's, a, it's just a great opportunity that we have to actually be able to love and care for the people around us in, in wherever their background is coming from. Um, so I love this initiative that you've done and, and um, how you kind of worked it all together. What would you say to somebody that's wanting to do something like that themselves in you know, because who knows where we're going to go from here uh, with the pandemic and so on. But what would you say? Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is like, it's a lot easier to do than you think. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there uh, to help you. So, you know, really the first thing to do, and it's just to make it really simple and just start with like your street, you know, and often it's the best thing to find what we encourage people to find one other person, one other neighbor. And then, you know, we people printed little leaflets, um, which was basically like a letter that said, you know, I'm Mark at, you know, number 68. Um, you know, it, you know, I'd love to know if you need help um, or if I can help you and if you want to be connected to others on the street. And then people just delivered that out or, you know, knocked on doors and step, step back some social distancing. And that was the way they started to sort of get to know their neighbors. And, wow. and it's really simple. And then, you know, then you just, you could set up um, a WhatsApp group or an email group or some way that people like to connect. Um, and it's that simple. And then it's amazing how people start to interact. Uh, and they start to share. They start to request um, help. Um, and then all of a sudden, people are starting to experience community. And we've met so many people that we would never have met wonderful people. Um, and uh, it, it's brilliant because I think that these days, um, I think in particularly highly urban environments, there's less and less like what we call sort of community space where we actually engage with people that we wouldn't normally meet. Um, and it is an amazing way of sort of creating little villages in the middle of these cities and towns. It's such a great way to uh, just be the hands and feet of Jesus, to express the love of Jesus to a world that is really hurting right now. Um, so I love it, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to share that with us. Well, that's such a powerful example of what it means to live missionally. And if you want to find out more about this project, you can go to their website at earlsfieldtogether.com. That'll explain more about what, Mark's, what this project is all about. But as I said, I think it's such a powerful example of what it means to live missionally. And as I listen to Mark talk, I think it, one of the things that he highlights, one of the key aspects of living missionally, and it's this, it's taking ownership. You see, Mark took ownership over his neighborhood. When COVID-19 hit, he didn't become insular. He didn't just start looking out for his own family. He said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be the hands and feet of Jesus to care for my neighborhood. And, and I'm going to use my gifting, my strategic gifting to help build a network, a structure to ensure that everyone is cared for and no one is alone. That taking ownership like that 
is what living missionally is all about. And so they just did simple things. You know, they put, put flyers through letterboxes. They, they went around and collected food for one another and for their food bank. They, they sang happy birthday from their front porch or from their front steps. They, 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 they put together um, text chains or WhatsApp groups. You know, these are all simple things that we can do. But it starts with somebody taking ownership, somebody saying, hey, I, I, it's not okay with me. Not on my watch am I going to let somebody go uncared for or be alone in this season. Who is God challenging you to, or who can you take ownership for in this season? Is it your neighbors? Is it your course mates? Is it your colleagues at work? All of us have been placed somewhere where we have influence. And living missionally means taking ownership for those people and say, I'm going to live missionally among these people and be the hands and feet of Jesus in order that I might demonstrate the love of God through my actions and share the good news and the hope of Jesus through my words. Well, this next conversation that I have is another great example of what it means to live missionally, and it's with John Book. Now, many of you know John. He used to be on staff here. But in 2016, he and his family and another couple here in the church moved to Turkey. And they've been living there ever since. And so earlier this week, I had the opportunity to speak with John and hear what they've been doing and how they've been living missionally in this pandemic. Let's have a listen. Well, hey, John. Good to see you. Hey, Todd. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, speak with me today. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, John has been a part of what was a part of what we're doing here in Sheffield uh, for how many years were you here? Seven and a half. Seven and a half years. And, yeah. uh, and you've been in Turkey now for how long? Yeah, we've been here for just over three years. Um, we, we left Sheffield in the fall of 2016. And after like a six months of some other stuff, we ended up here in May. Uh, 2017. You know, tell us a little bit about your family first. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so my wife, uh, Ira, is um, from Uzbekistan, and we met, got married almost 20 years ago, and then we have two kids, uh, Nadia and Joshua. Nadia is going into year seven, and Joshua year five. Wow, great, great. Well, so you guys have been there for uh, three years, you said now, right? What does that look like? I mean, you, you talked about moving around a little bit, but uh, what has the first three years been, been like for you? Yeah, so our focus the first couple of years was really language learning and prayer. Um, we feel like the things that we want to see happen in terms of not just a trickle of people, but like a flood of people coming to Jesus and discipleship, discipling each other, that's not going to happen based on our own efforts, as amazing as we are. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but um, it's only going to happen through a supernatural push in prayer and like crying out to God and partnering with him to see what he's doing in the country. So we spent a lot of time on that. And um, then it's just sort of kind of being around people and trying to get into people's lives, which has proved harder than I expected. But that's, that's what it looks like. It, any hour of the day could be a work hour. Going out, trying to practice our language, praying, loving people. That, that's what we try to do. So um, with prayer, what do you feel like you've learned in the last three years? Yeah, sure. Man, so much. So the thing that it felt like God initiated with us to do, so we live in a pretty large city and it's divided into kind of 39 districts, um, kind of like Sheffield with Hillsborough and Fullwood and all those different areas. Um, and each one of those districts has its own personality and history and maybe even spiritual dynamics. So we felt like God um, brought us on a project or, um, yeah, a project where we kind of divided each one of those up, researched them, and then came together to pray and ask the Father what he was saying, what were the keys to that particular district. And it was really, really insightful. It was really, really helpful and gave us a lot more connection to the land in our hearts um, it really helped us connect us to the people. And then my wife and I, we, we prayer walk a fair amount or just even, we live in a, an apartment complex that's 13 buildings and several thousand people. Um, and so we'll prayer walk around here and I've kind of prayer walk in each building and, and things like that. Just get his heart for what he's doing here. And in doing that, I think 
you get more connected to, to where you are, the neighborhoods you live in and the district you live in and kind of understand what God's wanting to do there. Um, and I feel like that's brought change in the city. I mean, in fact, one time we had prayer walks um, for a couple of different weeks in a row in this one far district, an hour from where we lived. And then we had a meeting with some people an hour and a half the other direction. And they did media follow-up, people interested in, um, in the Bible through Facebook or whatever. And they said, we've been getting this huge influx of people out in this district that's two and a half hours away from us. What are we supposed to do? And who's praying for that district? And we were like, oh, we were. We have, we've been out there <laughs> prayer walking the last couple of weeks. It's wow. pretty amazing just to see, like, it makes a difference. When you cry out for your city, when you really learn what's going on, it can make a huge impact. Like, that's the key to winning Sheffield, I think. Wow. Now, for those who aren't familiar, what is a prayer walk? Um, well, you walk and you pray. <laughs> it's wow. really, it honestly, is as simple as that. But you kind of <laughs> pray for, you know, if you're walking through like a business area, you pray for businesses, you ask God what he might be doing there. If you're walking through residential areas, you sort of pray street by street. Um, kind of, you go with two or three people in, in your group and take turns praying and maybe stop at a corner and ask if God wants to speak anything, or even if there's someone who wants you to talk to. It's, it's pretty simple, right? It doesn't have to be anything complicated, but I just think even in doing that, it's almost like we're, we're claiming the land by walking the land and crying out to God. Right, right, oh, that's great. Now, tell us, after three years of living in Turkey, what's one thing that you really love about that country? Yeah, there's a lot that's great about, about Turkey. Um, the people tend to be really warm and hospitable. It's not hard, especially at a surface level. It's not, it's not awkward or hard just to talk to a random stranger. Um, one of the easiest ways to meet people here is to be somewhat helpless, they're, <laughs> which is great because I am. <laughs> so they're generally eager to help if you're in a situation where you don't know what to do or you don't understand how to you know, do something at a bank or at a shop or whatever, they'll, they'll be really eager to help. So that's, that's really refreshing, really great. What would you say is one of the bigger challenges of living in Turkey? Yeah, so um, there, there's two, but they kind of go hand in hand. One is just in, in sharing with people about our faith, people are well up for talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, but they've had this sort of script ingrained in them through the religious education that they have in their school and through their own experiences, where I can predict almost with 100% accuracy what the response is going to be to each thing that I bring up. And there's almost no getting them out of that script. For example, if I you know, bring up you know, something about the Bible, they're going to tell me, well, the Bible was changed by the Jewish people to say what they wanted to say, and it's been warped. It's not God's true word. Now, I can provide plenty of evidence that that's not the case and ask them questions uh, that they can't answer about why they think that's true. But here comes the second part. I have to do all of that in Turkish. <laughs> and <laughs> Turkish is an extremely difficult language. It, it works in an almost completely opposite way from English. It's very difficult for Turks to learn English. It's very, very difficult for English speakers to learn Turkish. Now, I learned Russian um, in a previous um, place that I lived, and it took me about a year to get comfortable conversationally. And in two years, I was not like scientifically fluent, but very, very impressive. And I'm nowhere near that yet in Turkish because the, the structure of the language is so difficult. So I'll get in conversations with like taxi drivers or whatever, and we'll, they'll bring up the Bible being changed. Or they'll bring up the Trinity. Now try and explain the Trinity to someone in English. <laughs> is difficult right. enough. But trying to explain it in a language you don't actually quite speak is a whole other thing altogether. Wow. So it's been frustrating, honestly. Learning the language has been slow and frustrating, and I, I feel there's times when I struggle feeling like I've failed because I haven't gotten where I, I should be at three plus years. Yeah, I, I have seen a diagram that I think we'll show here of Turkish and it's and it's almost like you say, it's like uh, the, the order of the words is inverted from what you would do in English. So having to train your mind to think backwards in a sense, uh, I, I can't imagine how difficult that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the placement of one word affects the endings of all the other words and you have to memorize a thousand different endings for whatever case you used it in. Right. Hard. Oh. So a lot of the journey for you right now is about just the patient step-by-step, day-by-day faithfulness of just learning that language uh, in yeah. order to be able to just carry on those conversations, which are, as you say, tricky in English 
um, much less in a completely different language. Um, yeah. Wow. That <laughs> is, um, so what keeps you going in the, the you know, cause I've studied languages before and man, it's dry. Some days are great, but some days are real drudgery. What keeps you going on those days? Honestly, what keeps me going is this inner drive that God has put in me that I don't want to waste my days. So if I, you know, years from now or whenever leave here and I never pushed through and, and did it, that feels like I've wasted those years to me. So saying, God, I want to be pleasing to you. And you put us here for this time, for however long that is, we have no idea. Um, so I want to make the most of it. And, and to make the most of it, I have to learn this language. So I'm going to trudge through it. You know, I found some, we've started watching some Turkish movies here and there. We'll put, have it, the English subtitles on sometimes, sometimes just Turkish subtitles so we can read and listen at the same time. Found ones that are like funny or entertaining and kind of finding new ways to practice has been really helpful. But just also that inner drive to say, I'm going to make the most of our time yeah. has, has carried me through it, even when I don't feel like it's going that well giving up doesn't seem like an option <laughs> what would you say in terms of connecting with people right now how is that going have you been able to build relationships and kind of even yeah. with some of the language barriers so it's become um a lot easier since we moved a year ago and before the virus hit i'd started going to um just trying to find places that connected with things that were a natural fit for me or a place where I could meet guys. So just across the street from us, there's a billiard club. And I do not fit in there at all. Um, it is like working class, younger Turkish guys who have never talked to a foreigner in their life and are baffled as to why this guy keeps coming in there, this Yabanji, as they say, keeps coming in there. But um, that's kept them interested enough to keep trying to talk to me. So that, that was good. And then I also found a board game club that had like open nights. I like board games. So I'd go there and right. mix with people. And that was like all moderately successful. I prayed for a guy once in the billiard club who got healed and that shocked him immensely. He was so confused by how he got healed on the spot. Um, and, wow. and that was really fun, but it wasn't like developing any actual relationships. And then the lockdown started. And our world became basically our apartment complex, which again is 13 buildings, 2,000 people. Um, the kids at, for about 10 weeks weren't allowed to go outside at all oh. um, as part of the lockdown um, outside the apartment complex. So um, we put hung notes on people's doors in our building saying, you know, we're here if you're struggling with anything or you need someone to run errands for you or if you want prayer for encouragement we're here and a few people texted us from that that has started some relationships and then just being out and about as things have relaxed more and the weather's gotten better in the evening um, our apartment complex has a pool so the afternoons tons of people are out there it's easy to meet people there um, and in the evenings the basketball court and playground and barbecue area making the most of every opportunity um, well, John, how can we be praying for you? Help! No. Um, <laughs> like that. Um, you can, sorry, you can cut that if you want. Um, you can pray for us just that, you know, Moses prayed in, um, in Psalm 90. He said, teach me to order my days aright that I may gain a part of wisdom. It's really easy to, to fall into a pattern and just waste time on the internet or whatever. Um, and not put all, everything I can into learning or talking to people. Um, but just pray that God would order our days and order our time. So the, this summer, we're like, if we're stuck, if we can't really travel, um, what are we supposed to do, God? What can we do in our apartment complex? And he gave us the idea of starting a, an English club for kids, just sort of like an outdoor thing where they could play games practicing their English. And I wasn't really sure how to start that. We didn't know anyone who would kids the right age who spoke English. Then one day while walking around the walking track, I ended up having a divine appointment with this guy who's super influential, super connected. He owns an international business. He used to be on the board of the apartment complex, like run it, running it. He knows everybody. He has a daughter that speaks some English and he wanted her to learn more, although he was not convinced that this would be a good idea. So we gave it a trial run with just her and she loved it. He was shocked. So he got all these other families, and now twice a week we have this evening English club that we run. 
Um, but just praying into that, like that it would lead to actual relationships with their families and that we would find the people that are open and hungry. Um, the people in our complex tend to be pretty secular for the most part. So those that are open to the, the idea of God even being real and him inviting them into a process to get to know him. Pray for that, pray just for fruitfulness. And also I'm starting a new job in the fall. I'm gonna be um, a high school pastor at the private school our kids go to. So you can pray for that. Um, these kids come from a wide range of Christian backgrounds. Some barely believe, some have believed all their lives and are growing hard hearted. And just, I wanna be able to speak life into the high school there. So you can pray for us in that and that we learn this language. Wow. Yes. All right. We can do that. Well, John, thank you so much for you and for Ira and your yes to Jesus and your willingness to, to go and do the hard work to, uh, to be in this place. And uh, we're so proud of you and so thankful for you. And uh, uh, we'll continue to pray for you in the days ahead. Thanks, man. Hey, I think if, if we, I mean this, if we can do this, like any one of you can do it anywhere that you are. Um, and we love Antioch Sheffield. We love you guys. We miss it. We want to come to visit as often as possible. So hopefully we'll be seeing you uh, in the coming months. Who knows? So thank you for praying for us. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we'll talk soon. Well, again, what a great example of what it means to live missionally. And as John was talking, um, there's a couple of other aspects of what it means that, that kind of stood out to me to live missionally. Uh, first of all, I think it was his commitment to prayer, praying faithfully. You know, they realized that prayer is so powerful and that they needed to, if they were going to be effective in living missionally, they had to commit to prayer. And so they just simply started prayer walking in their neighborhoods and around their apartment complex and, and, and in other neighborhoods in their city. They committed to prayer and they even got to hear about some of the fruit of praying for their neighbors. And this is something we can all do. We can all pray, go on prayer walks and pray for our neighborhoods or pray for our apartment complexes. These, these are simple things to do. And, and I would wager that if you started doing this, you would begin to find that you start having opportunities to help your neighbors, to get in conversations with your neighbors, to, uh, to share the good news with your neighbors. Um, far more than before, there's something about prayer that opens doors for us. Or maybe instead of, or, or maybe you could also, or instead of going on prayer walks, you can do what John Eldridge challenged us to do a few weeks ago when he said, choose three people in your life who don't know Jesus and pray for them. Pray that they would have a revelation of who Jesus is. I think that's something we can all do. See, when we pray, not only does it open doors for us, but it changes our mindset. There's nothing that I can think of that, that helps us become uh, to, to change our mindset towards living missionally better than prayer. So taking time to pray faithfully is part of what it means to live missionally. And the other thing John said that I really liked is looking for open doors. <laughs> they were looking for open doors. And literally, they went around and posted notes uh, through, the, through the letter boxes of their apartment complex and just said, hey, we'd love to pray for you if you need anything. But, but they also talked about other things, whether it's just going out into the city and, and being kind of helpless out there and asking for help. And I mean, wow, especially for, for us guys, that doesn't come easily. Um, or, or, or maybe, you know, like John mentioned, going to a, a billiards hall where, where he was the odd man out, but it, it opened doors for him to have conversations with, with local people. Or, or, or maybe, it, you know, he mentioned um, uh, starting an English club there in their apartment complex. They just saw a need and they thought, well, this is a way for us to, to get to know people in our, in our area. Living missionally means just looking for the open doors that God gives you among the people that he's placed you with. And as we learn to embrace that mindset, you'll see that we have far more open doors than we realize. So friends, this is a critical for us in this hour. Living missionally is, is vital in this season because the world is hurting. The world is is so full of fear right now, so full of anxiety, so full of uncertainty, so full of anger, and it's looking for solid ground. It's looking for hope, 
And we have the answer. We have the, what people are ultimately searching for, and that's Jesus. He is peace in the midst of the storm. He is the solid rock on which we can stand. And we want to share that good news with a world that is hurting right now. And, and, and for that to happen, for us to do that as a church, we've got to each be willing to live missionally. It might feel scary right now, but there's nothing more exciting than taking that step of faith. I was just saying, hey, I'm going to take ownership over the people around me. I'm going to pray faithfully for them. I'm going to look for those open doors and then seeing God come through, open those doors and seeing people discover Jesus for themselves. There is nothing better. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a missional God, that you weren't content to just leave us in our own sin. But you came, you sent Jesus in order to rescue us, to seek and to save the lost. I'm so thankful that you did that because one of the the lost that you came to seek and save was me. Lord, help us, God. Help us in the midst of this, this trying and difficult season that we find ourselves in to live missionally, to initiate with other people, to do, to do what we can with the people that you've placed us with in order that we might share the hope that we have, the good news that, we, that, we, that, that, that the world so desperately needs to hear. God, help us to be ambassadors for you in this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's close in worship. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are good.
Well, that is going to conclude our service for today. But I want to remind you that if you want to speak to one of our pastors for anything at all, then why not head to our website, antiochsheffield.org.uk, and click on that Contact Us link. That would be the best way to get in touch with one of our pastors. I want to say thank you so much for tuning in and watching with us. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.